So, my name is Dan Burns. Uh, I've been sword fighting professionally for about six years. Yes, kids, believe it or not, that really is something you can do and make a living at it. Not a very good one. I do have a day job. <laughs> but I've been sword fighting for about six years. I teach classes. I do demonstrations like this at libraries and schools. I go to town festivals, renaissance fairs, things like that, all over New England. Uh, and what I have for you guys today is I've brought a few of my favorite weapons with me, and we're going to talk a little bit about what a sword is, how swords developed, how they're used, and why some of them look the way they do. Swords are really, really interesting for a lot of reasons other than the fact that they're just really cool, which they are. I've been into swords probably since I was about 10 years old. That's when my uncle first started collecting them, and i kind of been hooked ever since. Between that and the Princess Bride, I never really looked back. <laughs> the thing that I find most fascinating about swords, though, is from a historical perspective, the sword holds a really special place in human development. Because the sword is a tool, just like anything that humans use as a tool. And it's designed to do a very specific job. And the job that it's designed to do is not a particularly pleasant one, right? The sword is the very first tool created by humans for the express purpose of doing harm to other human beings. Now, there are other weapons that are older than swords. Uh, spears, spear throwers like the Adelaide, axes, knives, things like that. But warfare isn't what drove the development of those tools. They were all made for, for what? what? What else do you, can you use a spear for? Hunting. Hunting, exactly. You can use a spear for hunting. What else can you use an axe for? Chopping wood, woodworking, exactly the same thing with um, knives. Knives probably originated to split bone and scrape marrow out of bone. Old stone knives and uh, stone hand tools. But the sword doesn't really have a function beyond human-on-human -human warfare. And like I said, it's not the most pleasant job in the world, and it's a job that most of us probably wish there didn't need to be a tool for, but that doesn't change the fact that that's why the sword developed. And because of that, it holds a really special place in art and culture. It's our symbol, at least not just in the Western world, but worldwide. Anywhere where metal swords were made, the sword has kind of become a cultural touchstone and shorthand for a hero. Now, I don't have any really old specimens of swords to show you. Um, the oldest swords were found in Turkey. They were made of bronze. They were really about this long. They barely qualify as swords. They're more like long knives. And they're all relatively flat, including the handle. Have any of you kids ever held like a ruler or a yardstick and pretended it was a sword? Who's done that? By a show of hands. I know that some of the adults in this room have done that before, too. Yeah, so the very first swords, they were actually all flat, almost the exact same thickness as a ruler. They're found in a place called Arslan Tepe, which means uh, the hill of a lion in, in Turkey. And because it was really easy to cast flat bronze, but they couldn't be that long because bronze is a really soft metal. So if you make it too long, your sword will start to droop, and a droopy sword isn't really good for much. But swords developed from there into a whole bunch of different shapes and sizes. Now this is what we call a gladius. This is the primary sword used by the Roman Empire. And I say Roman Empire because the gladius doesn't really come into use until after the, Roman, the fall of the Roman Republic and the rise of the empire. Before that, they would use the weapon that this is based on, which is called a spatha. A spatha is a, or spatha is a little bit longer, and it's got a leaf-shaped blade. This one is rather straight, and it's a pretty simple shape, right? This is a really simple tool. You can use it to hack, and you can use it to stab. It's not a very good slashing weapon. The Romans never really used these for slashing. These were primarily stabbing weapons. If you've ever seen a picture of a Roman legionary, they usually have one of these in their belt, 
They also had a spear called the pylum. It had a long iron tip on it so that when it stuck into someone's shield, it would actually, the tip would bend. It would make it difficult for them to use a shield if it didn't manage to land home. And they also have a really big shield that covered most of their body. And this would be used right up against the shield so that as little of their body as possible was visible and was open to attack from their opponent. So you could stab really well with these. That's primarily what they're made for. And if you look at the shape of it, that makes sense, right? You can also generally tell what a sword was used for by trying to find the center of balance and see where it's weighted. The great thing about swords is swords generally, when you put one in your hand, they kind of tell you how they want to be used. And this one is actually pretty tip heavy, which means there isn't a lot of weight back here at the pommel, so the sword wants to fall down. So you're not going to use it for a lot of slashing because it doesn't move that fluidly, not like some of the other ones I'm going to show you. But it does come down really easy, almost like an axe. And it's also really easy to tell exactly where the point of it is so that you can stab with it effectively. And swords stay pretty much this shape for a very long time through most parts of the world. Even in places where they don't have iron, and they don't have metals, where they primarily use wood or stone for their weapons, you still see most of their we call them clubs because they're not really swords, but most of them are shaped. Shape. Most of them are shaped pretty much like this. And all the way back into the Bronze Age, this is about the style that you're going to see. Now, swords start to change as we get better, as human beings get better at working metal. When the Romans finally started to move north into Germany and the rest of, of northwestern Europe. They come across a tribe of people called, that they called the Germans. There are really a whole bunch of different tribes up in Germania, which isn't just the modern day country of Germany, but also they, uh, parts of France and Poland and all the way up into Scandinavia. As far as the Germans were concerned, it was, it was all Germania. As far as the Romans were concerned, it was all Germania. And they were really good at working metal. And one of the things that they would do is they would, in addition to burning coals that they would use to forge their swords, they would also burn the bones of animals. Now, some people think that they did that because they thought it would imbue the power of those animals into their weapons. Now, I don't know. But one thing that burning bones with the rest of your fuel for your forge does is it introduces a lot of carbon into the metal that you're working. And carbon is what allows swords to be strong. A sword with a lot of carbon in it is harder, but it's also, you don't want your sword to get too hard. Hard things shatter. You know what's really hard? Ice. Would ice make a really good sword? Nope. No, why? What happens if you hit someone with a sword made out of ice? Because ice is more of a hard thing, and if you hit it against something like that, it will break. It'll break, exactly. If something's too hard, it becomes brittle. So you want it to be kind of find the sweet spot between being hard and being flexible. But iron, or carbon, when you introduce it to iron, it makes steel. And steel has a lot of really great properties in that you can get it nice and hard, but it can also be soft enough to flex like this. You want a sword to be able to flex, because otherwise, if you hit something with it, like a shield or somebody's spine, you want it to have a little bit of bend so it doesn't break. And as we start to integrate that sort of metallurgy into our sword making, we're able to make our swords a lot longer, we're able to make them sharper. We're able to make them a little bit thinner. Part of the reason that this sword can be as long as it is is because of another really interesting development in sword making. Does anybody know, anybody have an idea what this groove down the center of the sword is? Anybody at all? What? Um, it's supposedly to channel away the blood. It was called, for a long time, these were called blood grooves or blood channels. 
Now, the idea was these were here so that if you stabbed somebody with it, it wouldn't get stuck inside their body because the blood would have a place to go out. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't get stuck. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have a vacuum inside my body. So, swords don't tend to get stuck in something unless they hit bone. Otherwise, they go in and out pretty easily. That's kind of the job. What this is actually called, and you gave exactly the answer I was hoping, I was hoping you would give, by the way. Um, because that's one of the more common misconceptions about a sword. But what this is actually called, it's called a fuller. And fullering is another thing that allowed our swords to get longer and thinner and sharper because what it does is it removes material from the center of a blade without compromising the structural integrity of it, without making the sword any weaker. So you can actually have something that's just as strong, but it weighs infinitely less. I mean, this is, it seems like a very small groove on either side, but that's a, that's a significant amount of metal. That definitely makes this whole thing a lot heavier. And the thing about a sword is, the heavier the blade is, the heavier the pommel is. Because like I said, we want to balance our weapons. So this is a perfect opportunity when we get to the point of the Middle Ages. That's when you start to see swords like this. Thank you very much. My beautiful assistant, everybody. <laughs> when you start to see swords like this, is right around the Middle Ages. And this is kind of what we think all think of when we think of a sword, right? This shape. This is what's kind of ingrained in our, our cultural psyche. Now, Everybody knows what this part of the sword is called, right? What is this called? Blade. The blade. Very good. What about this part? Yeah. A, guard. a guard. This is a cross guard. What about this part here? Handle. The handle. Very good. You can just yell out an answer if I ask the question. You don't need to raise your hand, okay? What about this part here? A pommel. A pommel. Exactly. So those are all the parts that make up a sword. And swords stay like this for a very long time. In fact, they still make swords like this, and you still see swords like this in active use up to about World War I. With a few, mod with a few differences, the guards change a little bit, the handle material changes a little bit, but the blade stays pretty much the same. They get a little bit longer in the, middle in the late Middle Ages because, again, metallurgy gets better, and also, you start to see a change in armor. And that's really what starts to drive the development of the sword from there. So these swords are really, really popular, really, really good, as long as people are using this stuff right here. Who knows what this is called? Chainmail. Chainmail, exactly. As long as people are using chainmail, these swords work pretty well, because they can still stab, so you can get in between the rings of these chain mail, this chainmail and kind of pop them open if you need to. And they're light enough that you can swing them hard enough that even if you can't cut through the chainmail, you can still bruise somebody or even break bones with the sword. So as armor starts to get better and thicker and heavier, you start to see swords become longer and thicker and heavier. Partially because they're trying to keep up with armor. And when you get to the point where you see knights in full plate armor, swords don't really work all that well. That's when you start to get really long, really heavy swords, because at that point, they're really just thin clubs. You're not going to cut through plate armor. You're really hoping to dent it. So swords start to kind of fall out of fashion on the battlefield as armor starts to develop. And it's replaced with things like a war hammer or war picks, if you've ever seen those in movies or TV or in book. Those kind of take the place of swords. The sword's just not, it's not efficient anymore, but it's still really cool. People still really like their swords, and a lot of people spend a lot of money on their swords. And swords have kind of, be, kind of became a status symbol. When you get into the Renaissance, which about between the, really in the, the 1500s, you start to see swords fall out of fashion. There, people started using them more as status symbols, so they start to get really gaudy. The handles 
Instead of being wood wrapped with leather, they're, they're made of gold. They've got jewels in them or gold and silver wire wrapped around them. They become really, really pretty. In fact, some of the handles got so expensive and people use them so infrequently that a lot of times what you would see is you would see noblemen carrying around a gold and jewel encrusted sword when really all it was was a handle welded on to a metal scabbard. They didn't even have a blade on it anymore because they were never going to use it. How many people here have been to Europe? Anybody? All right. Now, if you're in an old world European city, in the middle of the city, they have one long main road. What are the rest of the streets like? If you're in Italy or Spain, no. they're really, really narrow. So you really can't use a sword like this anyway in the city. You're not going to use it on the battlefield because it doesn't work for armor anymore. You can't use it for self-defense in the city because it just doesn't work. You don't have enough room to swing. If you move a sword this far in either direction, you're hitting the walls of somebody's house in some of these alleyways in these old European cities. So the sword kind of falls out of favor. The only people don't even really use it as a, a status symbol anymore because it gets to the point where everybody knows if you're carrying around a sword, okay, yeah, you're rich, you probably don't know how to use it. It's not really effective. So swords start to change. They keep some of their length. They do eventually get shorter, but they get a lot thinner. And they get a lot more ornate. Does anybody know what this type of sword is called? Anybody have an idea? Big. It is, it is relatively big. Um, this one needs to be cleaned a little bit. So this is called rapier. This style of rapier is really common in uh, France and Italy. This is called a swept hilt rapier. In uh, western and southern France and Spain, you would see cup hilt rapiers are much more popular and common, which they still have the cross guard and the handle, but instead of this really ornate sweeping metal, they have a metal cup usually with decorative holes punched in it. That's just there to protect your hand. Now, this sword is really, really thin. If I were to try and hit somebody with this, cutting like I would with this sword here, it would probably snap in half. In fact, the edges of this sword are really thick and they're not sharp, nor would they need to be. This is a stabbing weapon, and this is perfect for fighting in those really narrow alleyways in old European cities, because this is a stabbing weapon. You don't need to cut with this. You don't need to move from side to side. All you need to do is thrust. Now, the rapier also became really popular. Again, swords are expensive. Their status symbol. Most soldiers throughout history never used a sword. The spear is the most common weapon used by soldiers all throughout history up until about World War I. But one thing that people with enough money to own a sword also tend to have is a very short temper. And they tend to be very concerned with things like honor. Your average person really didn't have enough time to worry about because they were more worried about where the next meal was coming from. So swords like this started to be used in duels. Now eventually, that kind of got out of hand. So it became more and more common for cities throughout Europe to ban the wearing of the sword while you were um, out in public. And that's probably for the best, right? <laughs> if everyone was walking around with a sword, things could get a little hairy. But another thing happened around the time that these swords got really popular. And it's something that changed warfare forever. Anyone want to take a guess what it was? Firearms. Firearms. Gunpowder. And gunpowder made all that really heavy, fancy armor that people were wearing instantly obsolete. It just didn't work anymore. You were a big, bright target. It couldn't stop a musket ball. So why wear it? It made more sense to be more mobile. Now again, firearms weren't really common. They didn't become really common on the battlefield until more recent history. But that means if people aren't wearing armor anymore, the sword has a place to make a comeback. And it does 
in a lot of places in Western Europe. And what they did, again, it was expensive, so most foot soldiers are still using spears. But over farther east, in the Middle East, on the, in the steppes of Eastern Europe and, and Central Asia, cavalry is really, really popular. Cavalry had kind of been their secret weapon of, of the people of that part of the world for, for most of history. And one weapon that they used, in addition to spears and bows, are curved swords like this. This is called, this one here is called the scimitar. Um, you see a lot of weapons of this style, with a lot of different names, all throughout the world. Now this one's definitely weighted a little bit better than some of those heavy ones, a lot closer to the handle here. So this one can move a lot easier. You can do a lot more with this. Because this isn't just a chopping weapon, this is a slashing weapon. And the good thing about slashing weapons is that they're really effective on horseback. And the reason for that really comes down to physics. If you have a straight bladed weapon like this, and you cut something with it, the entire length of the blade comes into contact with whatever you're cutting every time you, stri every time you strike. So right here, about two and a half inches of the blade are coming into contact with my arm, which means the force of my swing is spread out over those two inches. It also means all two of those inches are going to get buried in whatever I'm cutting in, and that is going to make it harder to pull out. If you have a curved weapon, even with a slight curve like this one, only about an inch or half an inch of the weapon is coming into contact with whatever you're cutting. So the same amount of force, instead of being spread out, is now concentrated in a much smaller area. So in mu you need much less power to accomplish the same amount of damage with a curved weapon. And also, because only a small portion of the sword is coming into contact with what you're cutting at any given time, it's a lot easier to pull that sword out of whatever you cut. So it works really well on horseback. Because with a straight bladed sword, you're going to cut in just as deep, but you're going to have a lot more surface area stuck in your target, and there's a better chance that, that sword's going to get pulled out of your hand. With a curved sword, you can slice into something and pull out while you're on a gallop. And these are really effective. And militaries in the Western world start to kind of get that hint. So you see a weapon that is still issued to militaries today. It doesn't really see a whole lot of use anymore. But you were still seeing saber charges in the First World War and Crimean War. This is a replica of a U.S. Civil War cavalry saber. It's got a really slight curve to it, um, but the Americans particularly seem to prefer to straighten out their cavalry sabers. Um, you'll actually see a few um, of the swords that were preferred by um, General George Washington. Are, they look almost like a cavalry saber, but they're a perfectly straight blade, and some of them don't even have edges on them. They're, they're purely stabbing weapons. But that's not... There's a lot of debate as to how effective a pure stabbing weapon can be on horseback. But this shape is basically what becomes most popular for most cavalry units around the world. And I brought the American one because I figured that would be the one that most people would be kind of familiar with. And again, it's nice and heavy. It's still got the guard, but what's different about this guard? It's a bow guard. Exactly, this has got a knuckle guard. It doesn't have a cross guard anymore. It's still got a little bit of this flat guard up here from rapiers, more like the cup hilt rapiers. And it's got this knuckle guard that started to be introduced with rapiers. So this not only protects your knuckles, but also it protects the sword from being pulled out of your hand. So this allows you to have a much better grip on it from horseback. Because if you lose your, whore, your sword, well, I mean, yeah, you can still ride around and, and look fancy, but you're not actually going to be able to do anything about it. So these become really popular, and they stay in style 
until the early 1900s. And these are still, weapons like this are still issued to militaries all around the world. Um, the United States Marine Corps issues a weapon very similar to this to their uh, officers and NCOs. They call it the Mameluke Sword. Um, it's actually the replica of a, uh, a weapon closer to, to that one in style uh, that they received in Tripoli, which is modern-day Libya. During one of the Marines' first forays into that country, they were presented a sword. And that's what the role swords kind of took on in the late, as we get closer to modern history, is they become ceremonial objects. Because there's still a lot of power in a sword. Military officers in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, they're all presented swords. Because in our mind, in our culture, the sword isn't just a tool anymore. Throughout the long history of the weapon, it really became a symbol. It's a symbol of strength and duty and honor, and all of those things we associate with chivalry. Does everyone know the word chivalry? No? Yes? yes. Yeah? Are you familiar with it? Chivalry comes from the French word um, chevalier, which actually means horseman. Because for a long time, if you were rich enough to afford a sword, you probably also were rich enough to afford a horse. So the idea of a knight in shining armor on horseback with a sword, while it may not be the most accurate picture for most of history, that one snapshot of that specific time has really been ingrained in us as a symbol of you know, what, what an honorable warrior should be. And the sword plays a really big part in that. Now, of course, the sword doesn't just develop in Europe. Like I said, we, we looked at the scimitar really briefly. And like I said, curved weapons were, were particularly popular initially as you move farther east. So this one is more indicative of something that you'd find uh, in the Middle East. But as you go farther west, you continue to find curved swords as well as straight blades. And when you get into China, China has a number of weapons that look almost identical to this. They just have a straight handle. But they also develop some straight bladed weapons, like this one here. This is a modern Tai Chi sword. Tai Chi is a martial art that comes from China that is used nowadays kind of the same way a lot of people do yoga. It's a way to condition your body. It's relatively low impact. But it still has its roots in military training. Now this is a Tai Chi sword, so it's a little wobbly. The actual weapon called the Jan, which is basically just the Chinese word for sword. It's called the, the, the gentleman of Chinese weapons. And the Jan is a very light, straight-bladed weapon. It's sharp on both sides. You can cut with it. But again, its primary purpose was to thrust. If you ever see someone doing Tai Chi, it's a lot of thrusting motions. One thing that you are told to practice when you do, uh, when you start learning about the Jian, is taking progressively smaller circles and trying to thrust inside of it. So you can really develop control over the tip of the weapon. And that's part of the reason that these modern ones are so flexible, because you want as much wobble in the blade as possible as you try and control that. Tai Chi is all about controlling the weapon so that you know where it is and kind of building that muscle memory. You also see, as you go farther and farther east, probably one of the most famous weapons and most easily recognizable weapons once we get to Japan. Japan has a whole bunch of swords. They have straight bladed swords. They have long handled swords. But this is probably the one that most people know. Now this is a training weapon. This one's got no edge. That's why it looks really, really thick. But it's still a fairly good representation of a katana. Katanas are cutting weapons. You can stab with them. But the main purpose of a katana is for slicing. Again, it's a curved weapon. Less surface area when you cut. And a lot of mythology has built up around this sword, uh, especially here in the West. And that's part of that is because iron 
is not very common in Japan. They don't have a lot of good sources of iron like Europeans did. Europeans could make a lot more swords a lot cheaper than the Japanese could because they had access to better sources of iron. Japanese iron needed to be refined. You had to get all the impurities out of it. So everybody, how many people have heard about you know, a katana being folded over a thousand times as it's being made? All the steel for a katana does need to be folded and beaten. Part of what you're doing when you do that is you're beating impurities out of the steel, out of the iron, so that you're getting all that slag and, and bits of rock and other things out of it. You really only fold it over maybe ten times. Uh, if you fold it over a thousand times, first of all, it would take a really long time, and second of all, you wouldn't be doing anything after about ten times. Um, as we think, you fold it over once, now you've got two layers. You fold it over again, you've got four layers. You fold it over again, you've got eight layers, and it rises exponentially. Once you get to, I think if you were to actually fold it over a thousand times, you'd have something like 14 million <laughs> layers in it. At that point, you're just really moving atoms around. You're not doing anything to actually improve the steel. But you are folding the wet metal over probably between six and ten times to get some of the impurities out of it, and also, to strengthen the steel. You're, as you're working it, you are forcing the atoms of the iron into place. Katanas tend to be really thick back here on the spine and really thin towards the belly, and they're actually usually made of different types of metal in those two places. You'd have really high carbon content steel on the edge, really low carbon content steel on the back, and you would also Everybody's seen a sword being quenched before, right? You take it out of the take it out of the forge and shove it in a bucket of water or oil or the blood of your enemies, something like that. Well, in katanas, you do what's called a hamon, or a differential heat treatment. So before you put it into the forge, you'd actually cover the whole back end with clay to insulate it so the back end doesn't heat up, only the edge does. And then you quench it. And what that does is it gives you a really hard edge, but if something's hard, what is it more likely to do? Break. Break. So you don't want the whole sword hard. You want the edge hard because then you can get it really, really sharp. You get a really soft spine. So the town is really well made, and they're really, and, and part of that is because of that differential heat treatment. So you have a really sharp, razor sharp blade, but a really soft spine, so the sword is really, really strong. And the care and attention to detail that gets put into making a katana is part of the reason that it's kind of taken on this mythical status outside Japan, and even in Japan, because the, the craftsmen that work on these weapons are incredibly talented, and they take a very long time to create each one, and it, they really are works of art as well as tools. A lot of swords all over the world are like that, but the simple truth is they are still tools. And one sword isn't really better than another. I get asked that a lot. What's the best sword? That's really like asking a carpenter, what's the best hammer? Or what's the best screwdriver? Well, it depends on the job that you're trying to do. This sword is much better at certain jobs than this sword is. They can't do the same things. This is a much better stabbing weapon, and it's much faster. This gives you a lot more power. Same thing with the katana. People often ask me, you know, what's better, a, you know, eastern swords or western swords, European long swords or katanas? It really depends on the job that you're trying to do. If you're fighting somebody wearing wood and leather armor, as was really common in Japan, katana is a really awesome weapon for that. As soon as you introduce chainmail and you have a light, sharp weapon. Well, it can't cut through chainmail. That's, that's the reason chainmail exists. So a katana really wouldn't function in Europe the same way. Um, and European swords would be too heavy. They would, just wouldn't be fast enough for much lighter armored opponents that you'd come across in, in Japan. So it, it really does depend on the job that you're looking to do. What time is it? Where, where are we looking on time? 6.35. 6.35? Perfect. So, like I said, swords kind of fall out of fashion, fall out of use, rather. Ooh. He knows that it's his time. Um, 
in around World War One. You don't see him on the battlefield come World War Two. World War One is what historians often refer to as the first mechanized war, because that's when you really start to see artillery and, and firearms come into really, um, really common use. So the sword kind of falls by the wayside, with the exception of sports. So this is kind of what the sword has developed into today. This is an epee. This is used in one of the three styles of fencing, which is an Olympic sport. The three styles of fencing are epee, foil, and saber. There was originally a fourth called single stick, but that, uh, I think the last time that was in the Olympics was in like 1912. But fencing is one of the few sports that has been in every single modern Olympic Games. And initially, your fencing weapons look a little bit more like this. Everyone see kind of the similarities in style between these weapons? Because they're essentially the same thing. This is a sport version of this fighting weapon. This is an old fencing foil. Foil is the most common or most popular form of Olympic fencing. It's the one most people are probably familiar with. And each form of Olympic fencing developed to mimic a traditional form of sword fighting. Fences, foil and epee developed to mimic duels. Foil is a duel to the death. Because the target area, when you're fighting with a foil, is all stabbing, again, because it's supposed to mimic this weapon right here, stabbing weapon. And your target area is only the torso. Because this is where all the squishy bits that make your body work are. So if you stab someone in this area, they're probably not going to make it. So that's why that is the, the target area for a fence for the sport of foil fencing. This is a more modern fencing foil. See, it's got a rubber tip on it, so it stays nice and safe. If you stab somebody with it, it's very bendy, so it doesn't hurt that much. You can still get bruised. I've had a couple of bruises from fencing foils. But this is meant to mimic duels to the death. The epee is a little bit different. It's a much thicker blade doesn't have quite as much flex as the foil. But the target area for the epee is the whole body. This mimics a duel to first blood. So rather than having to kill your opponent, because even though people that have enough money to own swords and be concerned with things like honor and reputation, they still don't like dying. So duels to the death fall out of favor in, in favor of duels to first blood which means the first person to draw blood anywhere on the body is the winner. We're not going to keep going. I don't want to ruin my pretty face. I'd like to continue living. I apologize. That's how duels tended to work out in the later parts of history. And this mimics that because you can touch anywhere on your opponent's body, their head, their toes, doesn't matter, you still score a point. The last one, this one actually should be a little bit longer, but my saber broke and I haven't been able to get a new one yet, so I have to pardon me on that. But this is for saber fencing. Now this, and this look very much alike, correct? Yes. Yeah. No. Okay. No? In basic shape, obviously they look very different. The shape of these two weapons is similar, right? This is meant to mimic combat with this. And you can tell that from the target area for saber fencing. If you're fencing in saber, the target area is from the head to the waist, all the way down the arms, and the outside of the thigh. Those are all the places that would be vulnerable if you were sitting on top of a horse. And that is what saber fights, saber fencing is meant to imitate. It was a way, fencing like this was originally a way to train sword fighters without them having to worry about getting hurt. And it kind of developed into a sport from there. And this is kind of, this is the modern sword. This is what most swords in use look like. 
Now, we live in a really exciting time because a lot of people are getting more and more interested in these kind of swords. And a lot of organizations are popping up to help people learn about them and use them in competition. Um, one that I'm a member of is called the HEMA Alliance. HEMA stands for Historical European Martial Arts. And there are a lot of people doing a lot of great research and hands-on experimentation, reinterpreting how a lot of these weapons were actually used on the battlefield, looking at old fight manuals from the 1500s, translating them from the original Spanish or German, um, and, and really exploring how these weapons were used and, and trying their best to bring them into the modern age and give all of us a little bit of an opportunity to to kind of step back in time a little bit. Now I do also do historical weapons um, demonstrations and lessons. So if anyone is ever interested in learning how to use these weapons properly and safely, by all means, reach out to me, get in touch. We can work something out. Um, I want to take some of the time that I have left to take questions from you guys about Anything that we talked about, anything we didn't talk about that you're interested in, anything at all. Yes? What was the flamberge? A flamberge? So a flamberge is um, not really, a, it's a blade type. And the, I wish I, I, wish I had a, one. So a flamberge blade kind of twists like this. It, it comes from the word for flame because it kind of looks like a flame. Um, there are a couple of different theories as to why the blades were made like that. Um, part of it is because it looks really cool and scary. And that's a really legitimate reason to make some, to, to design a sword a specific way. A big part of combat, especially back in the day where combat actually meant getting up and close and personal with somebody, is how scary you were, how intimidating you could be. Um, so a flamberge definitely had that exotic, scary look. There is also uh, some evidence that if you, a, a wound with a flamberge, especially a stab, because of the irregular edges, it doesn't, the, the wound doesn't match up as evenly as it does with a straight bladed sword. So it becomes really difficult to, to stitch up. It, it's just a lot more devastating a stab wound. Um, so they're not, but they're difficult to make and they don't do much better than a straight bladed sword. So they, they didn't really catch on for all that long. You do see them, however, um, in the Philippines um, with their, their Chris swords tend to have a flamberry blade. Um, there's some religious significance to that for their culture as well as far as the number of undulations and things like that. But the, the benefit of having a blade that shape doesn't always justify the work that goes into making it. So that's why they weren't more popular. Anybody else? Yeah. Do you have a the blades, or is that any um, So right, this is the only blade uh, up here that is currently sharp. Um, I usually don't sharpen them because most of the time I'm not going off into battle with them. I'm, I'm coming here, I'm coming to libraries or schools or things like that. Uh, and it's a lot safer to have blunted edges. It allows me to let people handle them and not have to worry about anybody getting hurt. Um, but I do have sharpening stones at home. I do, I try to keep this one sharp. Um, but again, I, the only reason I keep it sharp is mainly because every year after Halloween, me and my daughter go out and we would cut our jack lanterns in half. Um, <laughs> so but that's really the only thing, that's, that's the only real cutting I ever end up doing with this. But, but back in the day, would they. Oh, yeah, back in the day, you'd, want it, you, you'd definitely want to keep it sharpened because you, not only will you end up dulling the blade over time, but also you end up with chips in it that impact its, its cutting ability. Um, it makes it more likely to get stuck on things. So you would want to sharpen it down. And you'll actually see, um, when you see historical pieces that have been used a lot, they actually end up getting really thin blades. Because every time you sharpen your sword, you're taking metal off of the edge on both sides. So the sword does actually get thinner and thinner the more you sharpen it. Um, 
But no, it would have been very important to keep your blade clean and sharpened because it, you don't want to you don't want to go in to do a job with a broken tool, right? Uh, you don't want to use if, if your short sword's not sharp. It's just like trying to use a, a screw that's stripped out. It's it, it's not going to be able to do some of its basic functions. Anyone else? Where are the swords made? Where are they made, or how? Where are they made? Where are they made? Um, so these are all made in. All of these weapons are made in different places. Um, this one, the blade of this sword, I believe, was made in India. Um, it was assembled, and all of the finishings were made here in the United States. Most reproduction weapons on the market, uh, especially blades, come out of uh, come out of either India or Pakistan. Um, the ones that come from Pakistan tend to be more ornamental blades. They're not the the best for for actual combat and training. India has really amazing metal workers um, right now, and a lot of great industrial forges making blades. So you do get, I mean, you get some some poor quality what we call you know, wall hanger blades, but you can also get some really nice work coming out of there. If you want to spend a little bit more money, you can also have your weapons custom made by hand. Um, if you happen to know a blacksmith, there are actually a few really excellent ones here in Lunenburg and in the surrounding area. Um, and traditionally, that's that's how you go. I mean, the idea of mass manufacturing swords is, is really new. You can really thank the British Army for that because they wanted all their swords uniform, um, and they wanted them all available to their officers, and that's also part of the reason that a lot of sword blades come out of India because that was a source of cheap industrial labor for the British Empire for a long time. Um, a lot of uh, some of the more famous sword making locations throughout the world, Toledo, Spain, still has a really uh, great reputation for sword making. Um, there's a lot of uh, places in France that make very uh, high quality fencing weapons. This one, uh, this weapon here was actually made in France. It came to the, it was shipped to the United States in about the mid fifty. Uh, about the mid 50s, you can tell that because it has the words "made in France" stamped on it in English, which means it was subject to um, some of the, the new import laws that came into effect in the 1950s. But this sword maker, uh, Bruno Cote, has actually been making fencing foils since um, his family has been making fencing foils since the mid 1800s. Um, so some of these, you know, some of these places that are making weapons have been doing it for you know, generations. Yeah. Are there certain standards and procedures to acquiring swords, or can anyone just buy a sword and have one? Um, it depends on where you live. Massachusetts has some um, certain types of weapons are very hard to to get here in Massachusetts. Um, New Hampshire is kind of the wild west, as most of us know. Um, but you don't need a special license or anything like that. If you're 18 and you've got the money, you can buy a sword. It's hard to find good quality weapons by just you know walking into you know a lot of times you walk into a head shop and they've got a bunch of swords on the wall. If you actually hit something with any of those, they probably snap in half. They're more dangerous to you than they are to anything else. Um, but if you've got the money and you know what you're looking for, there's really nothing stopping you from buying a sword. Um, I initially got into swords, like I said. When I was really young, I started collecting them probably at about 14. I would you know, ask my uncle to buy them for me, and I'd get them as gifts and things like that. Mostly wall hanging, you know, things that weren't suitable to do anything would hang on my bedroom wall. Um, I was lucky that my parents were very patient and very trusting. Um, I did break a number of, of ceiling fan globes, spinning swords around in my bedroom. Thankfully, they did not take them all away from me. Um, but yeah. There, there isn't really anything stopping anyone from buying a sword. As far as carrying them around in public, that's very, very different. Um, especially in Massachusetts, if you carry anything with a blade longer than, I think, eight inches, um, you will be stopped by the police. They will take it away from you. Uh, even this one here, this is, a, this is a stage combat weapon, so it, it doesn't have an edge. It's made to be used in theatrical productions. It's a lot more flexible than the other ones. Um, it's got no tip. It's got no edge. I had this in a sheet as part of like a Halloween costume. Um, 
and it was confiscated by the police in Salem. They brought it to the police station and said, you can come pick it up tomorrow. They were very nice about it, but you do not want to walk around with a sword on your back or on your hip, especially in Massachusetts, it will get taken away. There are some places that you can carry swords openly, like the great state of Texas. Um, so if you ever feel the need to walk around with a sword on your side, totally legal in Texas. Anybody else? Yeah. Where did you first start learning how to professionally sword fight? Where did I first start learning how to sword fight? Um, so it was kind of difficult for me because, like I said, I started off collecting swords, and I became more and more interested in how to use them properly. I kind of got bitten by the history bug, and I've been a better, huge history nerd my entire life. And so I started reading all about how swords were used. There's a lot of old fight manuals and things like that, like I said, that were you know, translated from the Spanish, the Italian, and the German. And a lot of them have illustrations. So you kind of read them, and, but they're kind of hard to put together. And I was lucky enough, I was, I was looking through, trying to find a job after I got out of the military. I was going back to college. I needed something part-time. And I came across a job listing that said, uh, sword fighters wanted, no experience necessary, we'll train you. I said, that's awesome. I will go ahead and apply for that job. Um, I got the job, got to sit in on a couple of classes, and after a while, the instructor who had a, a really great background in martial arts, particularly Eastern martial arts, was really excellent at, at teaching footwork and basic forms, but I quickly realized that I knew a lot more of the history of these weapons than he did. So I started chiming in more and more in the classes, um, and eventually, it got to the point where he was like, you know what? You know the footwork now. You have the, the historical knowledge. Why don't, why don't you start teaching some of these classes? Why don't you be my assistant? So I taught as an assistant for a while. Um, and then I started rewriting the curriculum because there were some things that were old. There were some things that were inaccurate. They were focusing mainly on just uh, German longsword when there was so much more. Um, and so eventually, after a couple of years, I ended up building uh, a 12-month rotating curriculum of different sword styles from all over the world and just immersed myself in it after hours. You know, uh, I switched my major to, to military history and just kind of threw myself in it full force. And I've been doing it ever since. So, it was something that I kind of fell into, but I wouldn't have been able to fall into it if I hadn't kind of been building the skill set almost my entire life without really realizing it. Um, and I'm still constantly learning. My, like I said, I, I don't have a really robust martial arts background. My background's mainly in history. So I'm still going out of my way and learning and, and meeting up with other people that have been studying sword fighting for decades and, and practicing with them and sparring with them and learning from them. And sword fighting as an art has kind of been lost to us because people haven't really done it for hundreds of years. We have these manuals that are illustrated, but they're missing key pieces, things that people just kind of assumed you would know because Everybody knows that. Well, yeah, everybody you might have known that 500 years ago, but we don't now. So a lot of sword fighting is also kind of experimental archaeology, where you, you get these, these replica weapons that are as close to historical examples as you can get them. And yeah, you can read all day about how they're supposed to be used, but the nuance of it really comes in the doing as you start moving with these weapons and learning what's the most efficient way to swing and strike and move your feet and move your body, actually practicing with the swords kind of puts all those things and those manuals into context. So there isn't anybody out there that kind of certifies you as a sword fighter. There's no test you can take or anything like that. I'm a sword fighter because I call myself a sword fighter. I like to think that I know enough about it that I can teach people something interesting, uh, but I'm far from an expert or an authority, and I'm constantly learning, and I will be learning more about sword fighting for as long as I'm physically able to pick up a sword. Um, so, so that's kind of how I became a sword fighter, and the barrier to entry is really low. Like I said, it's really easy to buy a sword. It's, it's all about putting in the time and the practice, doing the research. You and then you. So, what's okay?
Um, as a librarian, I'm interested in knowing who you're reading for fiction, who does a good job explaining um, sword fighting and makes it seem real for you. Um, that is an awesome question, and I actually just finished listening to one of my favorite series um, on, on audiobook. Um, the author is Bernard Cornwell. He is a really prolific historical fiction writer. Um, he's most famous for his uh, Nathaniel Starbuck and uh, his Sharps, Sharp series, um, which takes place during the Napoleonic War. But he also does a trilogy called the Warlord Trilogy, set in post-Roman Britain. It's kind of a, a grittier retelling of the Arthur legend, a little more grounded in history. He also does the um, the Last Kingdom series. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that television show. That's based on uh, a series of his. The thing that I love about Bernard Cornwell and the, the reason that he makes it feel real to me is he doesn't romanticize it. And obviously he does. His characters are heroes and they do heroic things and they're noble and, and all of that. But when it comes down to, to the combat, to fighting, to when he writes battle scenes, um, they're scary and they're dirty and they're messy and they're, they're not pretty and they don't glorify... They glorify warriors but not war. And I think that's really, I think that's really important. Um, there are a lot of great things. People are capable of a lot of great things, and warfare and combat can bring out the best in people. It can also bring out the worst in people sometimes. Um, and as fascinated as I am with with warfare and weaponry and warriors, um, warfare itself is something that I really detest. I don't like to see it glorified. I don't like to see it celebrated because it's it's killing other human beings. It is messy. It is dirty. Um, and Bernard Cornwell does a great job of kind of highlighting the good in people without glorifying or glossing over um, the bad, the dirty parts of warfare. So um, his books are rather mature. I don't know that I necessarily recommend them to everyone in this audience, but as far as the adults are concerned, uh, Bernard Cornwell is a very high recommendation of mine. Yes? Um, on the similar lines, I was just curious in like historical um, fiction, but not in the books, but like movies or television, um, you know, how, how much of that is, is pertinent or correct or, or relevant, and how much has been like just been a theatrically choreographed versus, versus relevance to, to Most of the things you see in TV and movies are wrong. That's not to say they're bad. Film and theater have very different goals in mind when choreographing a sword fight than an actual fighter does. It's got to look good. It's got to be engaging. In it. And a good sword fight in a movie or on stage or on a television show has to tell a story. There's a narrative to the sword fight. Um, real combat is this kind of mostly chaos. One movie that does a really great job of showing good form in sword fighting is honestly The Princess Bride. The fencing in The Princess Bride is incredibly accurate. When they talk about the different styles that, that Inigo and, and uh, Wesley have, have studied in, they are actually fighting in those fencing styles. Again, that is more fencing than actual sword fighting. Um, but the footwork and, and the work that they do, the, the sword fighting that they do in that movie is honestly really, really good. Uh, That's the new version? The new version? There's <laughs> one that no, they're not, not making it. There's a shortage of good movies in this world, of perfect movies in this world, and it would be a pity for them to damage that one. Um, <laughs> although that is my, one, of my, one of my favorite gags when I'm sword fighting uh, with kids, especially with teenagers. Uh, Generally, if I, when I'm doing interactive, you know, kind of duels with foam weapons, uh, I like to fight left-handed. <laughs> Just so when somebody gets a little too cocky, I can remind them that I'm not actually left-handed as I throw the sword up and catch them left hand. Uh, but yeah, the Princess Ride does a really great job as far as, as far as film goes. But if it's engaging and it's fun and it's entertaining and it tells the story well, then that means it was done well. I mean, 
as much as I like to complain about historical inaccuracies in the film, you can ask my wife if it's a favorite hobby of mine. Um, as long as the sword fight tells a story and it entertains you, then it's well done. That's, that's kind of my, my take on it. Any other? Yeah. Um, what was the most common sword for a samurai to use? The most common sword for a samurai to use. So, part of being a samurai, a samurai is kind of like uh, a knight in medieval Europe. In order to be a samurai, you were part of the nobility. And being part of the nobility gave you certain privileges. And part, one of those privileges, was the ability to carry two swords with you. So the one that you would use most often, and that you would actually use in combat, is a katana, like this one. But the actual sign of a samurai's rank in society wasn't their katana. It was a smaller sword that they would also wear in their belt called wakazashi. It wasn't as effective in combat, it was shorter, but if you were in close quarters, sometimes a shorter weapon is better. The actual reason that you would carry a wakazashi, though, is because as a samurai, because you were a member of the nobility, you were expected to uphold certain standards. And if you fell short of those standards, you could bring a lot of disgrace to your family. Not only could you bring disgrace to your family, but you'd also lose your family's wealth. If you were to have your rank as a samurai taken away from you, you'd lose your land, you'd lose all your revenue streams, and you would kind of be left with nothing. So we often hear, and obviously the events, uh, a lot of the accounts have been sensationalized through, through the media, and, you know, from their retelling here in the West, but a lot of samurai did engage in ritual suicide. Part of the reason for that was because if, instead of being sanctioned by the emperor instead of receiving your punishment, if you chose instead to end your own life, your family would be allowed to keep your land and your, your children would be allowed to inherit. So it was a way to save your family the embarrassment of being dispossessed. And carrying that shorter sword was kind of your rank of office. So this is the weapon that samurai would use most often, but the actual sword that probably meant more to them was the shorter wakazashi. And they would also, and it also depended on their personal preference. Some of them, sometimes they wouldn't carry um, a katana, sometimes they would carry a ninjago, which is a much straighter bladed sword. Um, sometimes they would use uh, a naginata, which is essentially putting a katana blade on a spear. There are a lot of weapons, um, and what Again, because samurai are more closely, are very closely related to our idea of European knights, one thing that separated samurai apart was that they fought on horseback. And katanas are really good for foot soldiers. They're not great cavalry swords because they're a little too light. So your average samurai, when he was on horseback, would use a bow and arrow. Bow and arrows were really, really common and really prized among the samurai class. Being a good marksman with your bow and arrow, being good at archery, was it was considered part of being a, a very well-educated gentleman. So they would they would also be very proud of their bows and their, their bowmanship as well. Any other questions? What about a lefty versus a righty in a sword fight? Does yeah. someone have an advantage or um, a different technique? The techniques are, are pretty much the same. I mean, physiology is the same either way. Um, fighting a lefty can be difficult because you're just not used to it. Um, and traditionally, most people would probably fight right-handed anyway because being left-handed was kind of looked down on for a very long time, especially while sword fighting was was really common, uh, was really prevalent. So. Most sword fighters would fight right-handed. The other reason that you would fight right-handed is because for a very long time, um, tactics on the battlefield, you would make a shield wall or a line of men. And so you would have your sword in your right hand and your shield in your left hand. And your shield actually wouldn't cover you. You'd hold your shield out so that your shield covered your neighbor. And usually everyone would start with the shield in their left hand and their spear, their spears over their shield. 
And then once you got too close to the enemy to use your spear, if your spear broke or fell, then you'd draw your sword. But you had to have your shield on your left hand, because that's kind of how the shield, every man would protect the man to his left. Um, that's where you get, you know, the, the phrase right hand man. Um, one of the proposed origins of that phrase, I'm not an entomologist, so I can't say that's definitively where it came from, but it, it, I, have, I have heard it suggested that that phrase comes from being in a shield wall, because the person on your right side was the person responsible for your safety. Their shield was what was making sure you weren't getting stabbed in the chest. So if the guy on your right dropped his shield, it didn't affect him. The guy on his left was protecting him. It affected you. Um, so you don't get a lot of... In history, you probably didn't get a lot of left-handed sword fighters. Modern times, you do. And I can tell you firsthand, fighting sucks. Because everything's coming from the wrong side. It's very difficult. Uh, but that also means that they, as a lefty, you have to constantly adjust to that as well. So. I, I don't think there's an advantage to it. it is the novelty definitely throws opponents off when you first fight a lefty, but uh, it fades rather quickly. Yeah? If I can interject something on the left, right? Sure. Uh, I believe that the top eight of, of the ten U.S. top US, ten inventors in the United States are lefties because the left side of the brain controls the motor skills and that just that much quicker. Hmm. I. You know, I, 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 one of my friends is a is an Olympic level. He was a, a junior Olympian for saber fencing. He's still a, a nationally ranked saber fencer, um, and he does defensive lefty. I've never put two and two together for that. Um, and like I said, modern sport fencing very different from historical sword fighting. Um, but I, I wasn't aware of that. I'll definitely have to look into look into that connection. It's very interesting. Any other questions? Yeah. What would the uh, best metal be for a uh, functional sword? For a functional sword, steel. You get to come up with a an alloy that's better than steel. Um, for a very long time, the first swords were probably made of copper. Um, copper is you can get it fairly sharp. You can get it fairly hard. You harden copper in a different way than steel. Copper is work hardened, is a work hardened metal. So the more you hammer on it, the harder it gets. Um, but it's it's really soft, so you can't get a good edge on it. It tends to bend or, or have dents put in it. Um, so very quickly, ancient people started using bronze. Um, now initially they use copper when you find it in the ground usually occurs naturally with arsenic. And if you introduce arsenic into copper, you get an alloy that's very close to bronze. What we think of as bronze is uh, copper and tin, but arsenical bronze, which is arsenic and copper, mimics a lot of what doesn't get quite as hard as bronze, but it's a little bit easier to work, it stays sharper, uh, it doesn't bend quite as easily. Uh, Arsenical bronze and copper tin bronze gets used for a really long time. Bronze swords are probably a little bit more effective than regular iron swords uh, because bronze is easier to work and it's not much softer than, than iron. But as soon as you start to introduce carbon into the iron and you start to develop steel, you can really play around with the the chemical composition. Sword, forging a sword is, is a lot of science goes into it. And the best weapons, the best steel for weapons for a very long time came out of Syria, or is believed they came out of Syria. It was called Damascus steel. Now, in modern times, when we hear about Damascus steel, what we really mean is pattern bubble, which means people take two or three different types of steel, different carbon contents, mix them together, fold them over one another, and forge them into one homogenous piece. But because there are different carbon contents, depending on how you organize them, you can make your steel a lot stronger. But what in the past they meant by Damascus steel was, was very specific kind of steel that we now call roots. And we don't know how to make it anymore. There are a couple of metallurgists and blacksmiths that have been working for years trying to recreate um, the the, the techniques used to make this metal. It actually forms these microscopic carbon nanotubes in the metal that allows it to just, it, it, it's, it's remarkable for, for blade making. Um, we just don't know how to do it anymore. 
So that was probably the best material for, for sword making in history. But right now, um, you know, powdered welded steel is kind of now, there, there, are, there are stronger metals, things like titanium, um, which is stronger and lighter than steel, but it's a lot harder to work. You've got to get it much hotter. Um, it actually gives off poisonous fumes when you heat it up that hot, that high. Uh, trying to grind it down, the, the sparks in the grinder can be so bright, it's almost like a welding torch, and you can actually get retinal damage from it. So it's really not the best, it's just too hard to work to, to be a really viable alternative for sword plates. So good old fashioned steel is, is really uh, as good as you can get. Anything else? No? Have you have exhausted your, your curiosity at this point? Uh, if you'd like, if you want to come up, uh, there are a couple of these weapons that I'm more than happy to let you handle, um, as long as we kind of do it one at a time. If you want to get an idea for the weight of chainmail, this is real steel chainmail. It is very, very heavy. By all means, come and try and pick it up. Um, but that is all I have for you guys this evening. It's been my pleasure. Um, if you are interested in learning more about any of the stuff I talked about, um, private lessons, I do birthday parties, I do educational demonstrations. I'm also, I can legally perform weddings in all six states in New England, so if you want a first sword fight instead of a first dance at a wedding, I'm your guy. Um, I do stage combat choreography, so I have some flyers and the business cards up here. Um, you can find me on Facebook at uh, Dan Burns Swords. I generally post updates as to any places I'm going to be giving demonstrations like this, any festivals I'm going to be at. I also try to update it every now and then with interesting historical tidbits about sword fighting, swords, weapons, armor, uh, things like that. So you can find me on Facebook. Um, I'm local here at Bloomberg, so if you ever want to do some sword fighting, yeah. And for students in grade 6 through 12, can actually come in for some reading this coming summer and teaching combat sword fighting for you guys. Do you think well, you Yes, we will actually, when I come back this summer, we're going to do a little bit of history, but also I'm actually going to teach you how to sword fight with uh, safe foam weapons. Uh, I'll teach you some footwork, different blocks, guards, how to cut, how to thrust, things like that. So definitely come back over the summer for the summer reading program. We're going to have a lot of fun for that.